Right, so um, slight change of tact and direction now. Obviously, you've heard from the financial services community. We're now going to delve into the world of government and public sector. Uh, to introduce myself, my name is Alan Fuel. Uh, I head up marketing for UK and Ireland for Red Hat. Um, when I got invited to basically moderate this panel, uh, the reaction from one of my colleagues basically said it all went with a slightly derisive snort. So I've actually enlisted the help of my colleague Andy Downs. I'll let Andy introduce himself, who brings some domain specialism from our side from Red Hat. Yeah, so afternoon, everybody. My name's Andy Downs. Um, I'm sort of wishing I didn't turn up today, so uh, I've been dropped in it a little bit, but uh, it's fine. Uh, so I'm a, a solution architect in the Red Hat. I uh, work in the public sector, and luckily over my career, the last few years, I've been working closely with OpenShift, but judging by the people in the room, I don't think I'd ever call myself an expert, because we've got a lot of people users, people who write the thing, so yeah. So... I think, well, we've basically heard directly from the financial services end customers. Uh, I think the, the talk about speed of the market, we talk about how quickly things have come about. Actually, this event in itself uh, has come about very, very quickly, and it's amazing to see such a turnout. So on that note, we've got some fantastic guests with us, um, but obviously public sector in terms of speed and agility and trying to get organizations to join us, we've actually taken it slightly on its head. So what we have is four organizations that work with customers in the public sector. So Without further ado, we'll start at this end. Would you like to introduce yourself? Cool. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is James Curran. Um, I'm an ex-civil servant that worked at Department for Work and Pensions, um, Biz, and Department for International Trade. Um, I currently consult into government, and um, we were using OpenShift at Department for International Trade, and we're looking to expand it out across different departments, looking how we could do some cross-government collaboration. Hi, I'm Bill New. I work for UK Cloud. Um, we're possibly the, the largest uh, supplier of cloud services into the UK public sector, and we also serve the um, health sector as well. Um, uh, we have a, a multi-cloud strategy providing a whole selection of different cloud platforms, um, but have uh, been a, a keen uh, collaborators with Red Hat, both in our OpenStack platform, but also in OpenShift as well, um, where we're seeking to work with government departments as they move services and workloads to the cloud. Justin? I'm Justin Cook. I am a distributed systems specialist. I've worked um, on some projects with Department <coughs> of National Trade, Business Innovation and Skills, and Department for Education. Uh, hey, everybody. I'm Cal Basohi. Uh, I'm CEO of a company called DREE that provides uh, infrastructure consulting to governments in the Middle East, in uh, Central America, and the UK. I used to be a civil servant as well. Uh, I built something called the HMRC Tax Platform, which was a microservices platform started in 2011, and the 31st of January never fails to fill me with panic because I was the operations manager for that for two years, and uh, if you paid your tax today, shame on you, you should have done it weeks ago, <laughs> <laughs> because there's people stressed out on the other side. So to get, to get the conversation going then, um, we're seeing digital disruption across all sectors, um, and we know that you know, public sectors organizations would like to see themselves you know, alongside their peers and their commercial counterparts. However, you know, they do have their own restrictions and their own limitations um, due to the special nature of the departments. What are you seeing? You know, what, what are your experiences of the customers that you're working with? Um, so one of the really beneficial things that we saw was cross-government collaboration. So um, we were looking at how Obviously, every department needs to have hosting of some sort, and very much it's insulated in one area. Um, what we noticed was that other departments all wanted to do the same thing. They all wanted the opportunity to be able to spin up development environments, that type of thing, and potentially share it across different departments. So one of the things that we looked to share was um, our leverage between international trade and base, and that gave us a good opportunity to see how a cross-government model might work. Um, uh, you clay cloud we, we supported the project uh, that James has just been talking about and it was a great example of uh, cross departmental collaboration unfortunately it was an unusual example of cross departmental co uh, collaboration because uh, much of Whitehall is is incredibly siloed um, and if you look at uh, uh, overall cloud adoption in the public sector it is still lagging the private sector if you take a uh, uh, private sector at about 20 percent of workloads in the cloud central government's probably about 10 percent uh, but then if you get into areas like uh, local government or the health sector it's down at one or two percent 
um, and therefore uh, they have a long way to go uh, and one of the things holding them back um, and it was called out by the King's Fund recently in regard to the health sector is the, the fragmentation. Um, I mean, look at the number of trusts out there, look at the number of different local government organisations. There are collaborative bodies trying to bring things together, but that sort of <coughs> interdepartmental collaboration is unusual in central government. It's just almost um, non-existent elsewhere. We need to be able to drive that. And uh, uh, some of the technologies that we're talking about here are around containers and, and shared services and thing, they are the way forward. It, it has to happen at some point, but we're not quite there yet. Okay, thank you. Justin. <clears throat> so government silos are really good for innovation. It's also bad for innovation. Um, mind share is the biggest problem that I encountered really. Um, with, with the change that we're seeing with Kubernetes and OpenShift, it's really difficult to um, see a rapid adoption across so many silos that have their own independence with the disruption that it causes to deliver. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'd echo some of the things that people said there about silos. I think the other thing that I'd maybe bring to the table is that um, government has been and still is, I think, in you know a large sense, a really bad technology sort of purchaser. Um, and some of this, I think, you know, my own experience has been um, there being a, a, a sort of low level of genuine technical skill within government departments. Um, and so actually, um, the ability to like evaluate and, and get value out of um, products has been, has been pretty low and has, and has been dependent on um, vendors, right? And dependent on, in, you know, historically quite large vendors. Um, that's, and there's, there's areas and pockets where that's changing, but the majority of, of cases in, in um, sort of IT purchasing and sort of technology purchasing is still sort of driven quite far away from uh, the people who have to kind of, you know, deliver or operate or, you know, um, use products, right? Um, and that, that to me is quite a big challenge. Um, and I think that um, some, of the, some of the seeding of departments with, you know, internal development capabilities has pushed now what works for, say, some developers, right? So um, departments that have um, got in internal development capabilities and developers are driving discussions about what kind of tooling there should be, what kind of, um, you know, platforms, what kind of um, things people should be using. But that doesn't really, you know, take into account often the operational sort of need of a, de of a, of a department. Um, and, and B is often driven by, you know, quite parochial concerns because, um, government departments don't pay very well and find it hard to hire, you know, people who are invested in the long-term, um, you know, outcomes that those departments are looking for. There's a reason that two of us are ex-civil servants on this, um, on this panel. I, I imagine James's reason is reasonably similar to mine. And um, if, if we were, you know, invested for, you know, five, seven, ten years in making those technology decisions, um, I think we'd see different outcomes to being invested for, say, a year or two. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so, I'm, as I said, I'm lucky that I work with OpenShift a lot within my team, and there was, for a long time I found, it, I found it a really cool technology, so I've considered myself lucky to play in it. You guys have all had experience from uh, various times, various views on this, so what is the thing that sort of drew you towards that in, you know, from your experience? So if we start with this end with James and then work down again, just give you a chance to have a ring. Yeah, sure. Um, safe. My role was more of like a product manager and program lead, so what I saw the benefits were, so Justin, who was working in my team, was spending a lot of his time having to update Kubernetes, Docker, and actually do that manually, whereas the advantages that we saw was that you could use that in a more automated way and be able to use the deployments of OpenShift versions rather than having to, um, I wouldn't say waste our time, but spend a lot of time having to maintain our systems rather than getting something automatically updated. Um, from our perspective, uh, we, we worry, uh, always sought to serve the market um, and the clients that, that we operate in. Um, and we are purely focused on government sector and, and health. Um, and initially we had largely a, a VMware-based uh, uh, environment um, which catered for the lift and shift of, of virtualized workloads. Uh, very soon after that there was a call for uh, OpenStack environment and we, we partnered with Red Hat for that. Um, and indeed we worked with these guys because they were one of the departments that, that um, demanded that of us. Um, and very rapidly after that it became apparent that again the clients that were uh, some of the more forward thinking in, in central government were looking to 
to move to Kubernetes. And again, we did an evaluation uh, and went with uh, Red Hat and OpenShift. Um, but uh, this is what it's being called for. But again, we have to look at reality here. This is only being called for by those that are really at the leading edge and really trying to push the envelope. There are a vast majority of uh, uh, workloads in uh, sort of the public sector which are, are way, way behind this. Um, and uh, as there's an orientation around shared services um, and the, the, the government mindset about what shared services is, is a very old world perspective. Um, and there's been a big debate in the press recently about how they sort of deal with the large Oracle and SAP estates without really looking at sort of where they need to be going with microservices. Um, there have been some uh, uh, notable uh, um, uh, projects and advances around uh, key services like Gov.UK Pay and Notify and, um, uh, uh, and the identity uh, management platforms. But these are uh, uh, isolated examples. Um, uh, it's a very slow tide, but we're, we're, we're talking to some people here at the leading edge. Thanks, Bill. Justin? We were doing a Greenfield project, um, and that was really cool. Didn't have to worry about existing code bases. Um, the infrastructure convergence patterns are really attractive, and they just make a lot of sense. We were able to abstract away the platforms. Developers love that. Um, <clears throat> their artifacts were immutable. Again, love that. Everything is, well, you have data and everything else is code. So it all really made sense. I actually ansibilized uh, the Kubernetes rollout, went to Australia for a couple weeks, came back, they loved it. That was cool. OpenShift V3 was at 3.2 at that time. Um, it all just fell into place. Uh, so I grabbed the Ansible playbooks, uh, did some upstream commits, and it, it worked, and here we are. Thank you. Um, I, um, I'm not 100% sold on OpenShift. Uh, let's, uh, are you allowed to say that here? Is that okay? Um, <laughs> the, um, I, I've built uh, two sort of homespun platforms of my own. Um, I'm a big, I'm not really sold on anything right now. I kind of feel like there's so much, there's a lot of turbulence in the um, infrastructure space. In the, in the past, I, I, and I still am a very big uh, fanboy for Heroku. I don't know if people in the room are sort of that aware of, um, of Heroku, but the idea, like, the, to me, the develop, for, for a developer, the development experience can sort of almost be magic, right? And I feel like a lot of the um, implementations of sort of platform type stuff that I see falls very short of magic, right? And um, we have the, like, automation capability to, to make that happen. It's almost always, like, organizational will or, you know, something called security or something like that that stops that from happening. Um, Heroku is the closest I've ever been to magic. Um, the thing I like about OpenShift is that it's kind of not hugely opinionated, which is odd given that I um, care about um, the, the thing I really like is Heroku, which is incredibly opinionated. But when you're working in like organizations that are very messy and sort of brownfield and have lots of different things going on, it's almost useful to have something that's a bit more, you know, I can bring a, I can bring a service breaker, that's a nice one, right? I can bring something, I can, I can plug and play a bit more than having to um, anticipate the exact needs of, a, of an organization and, and kind of like work out which technology is going to fit that. Um, I like the fact that I can use an Azure Docker registry or, um, you know, uh, the internal Docker registry or some other Docker registry, depending on whatever my organization, whatever my organization cares about. And that's what I like about OpenShift, but I still feel that most products in this area um, are falling short of like magic. And I, and I feel like there's more and more magic coming um, but it's not, it's not there yet. Okay, so in an effort to make my job easier then, so um, and, and, you know, my job is to push OpenShift to my customers. If some of them have taken it, they're, they're fairly happy. How would you, straight back at you, how would you, um, how would you sell OpenShift to say some of those benefits if you're not sold on it? What are the bits that you, know, you, you would want to improve? You'd want to, you know, you want us to go back and look at? Um, everybody, everywhere you go, and we have a lot of debates about this, but everyone, everyone, everywhere you go wants best And um, the, the very idea of best practices, you know, some, you know, some, some oasis in the, some chimera or something, right? But there's something, there's some kernel of, of truth in that. And, you know, making it easier to uh, consume patterns that other people have created in the past and, and identify them as patterns, right? So the great thing about open source communities is there's lots of stuff, but actually the idea that some of this stuff fits together to create an outcome, somebody needs to do that curation of, of stuff. That's, that's my 
um, opinion, and that's what I spend a lot of my time doing, right? I kind of like pull a bit of Helm, pull a bit of, you know, Azure, put a bit of this, and then put together a thing that's not really any of my original engineering talent in it, but I've, I've seen a few pieces that solve a problem for someone because I've uh, been around the block a bit. Um, the other thing uh, that I would say that is coming up more and more and actually is driven more by the work that we're doing in the, in the Middle East and in, in, um, in Mexico is the, the sort of question, the nascent question that I guess some people are actually grappling with but we're more sort of playing with is um, can you containerize everything? Um, I'm very interested in the idea that um, sort of operator um, experience is, is like a burden, right? If I have to use like 27 tools to do my day job, that's like a burden. That's, that's, I, I spent a lot of time running an operational team, you know, dealing with outages, dealing with post-mortems, and lots of things, you know, are, hey, it's confusing. There's 17 different ways of doing this, or there's 12 systems, or how do you, you know, the recent example of this, you know, Hawaii um, uh, alert, right, where it was like those four buttons that were labeled almost the same thing. And I kind of feel like, being able to consolidate around one user interface for operations, it, you know, there's some value in this. And if that user interface could be something, you know, let's say, let's call it OpenShift, but through OpenShift I could run the stuff that I currently think I have to run using, say, Puppet, or I ha have to run using, you know, some homespun bash scripts or something like that. If I can consolidate that around one operator interface, I feel like I can get benefits where things are currently falling between the cracks of lots of interesting, useful bits of automation that haven't been consolidated. That's, I don't know how you make that a feature. I'd be happy to talk about it more, but you know. So I think just before this, Justin, we had a conversation and you talk about OpenShift Kubernetes has been disruptive technologies. So can you go into that, how you've seen that be, be useful to you? you know, so you've, got, you've had projects get off the ground based on these disruptive technologies. How do you feel that's worked in the departments that you've worked with? <laughs> Overall, I feel it was uh, a bit of a struggle um, because there's a lot of uh, the silos are independent, <clears throat> and to get them to um, adopt something so different um, comes down to the, the mind share changes. Like you know, for instance, I'm a preferred Debs. I've been doing Debs or RPMs for 20 years. Um, Everyone rolls the same. I've been doing it so long that my scripts just do that for me. Why should I, you know, go ahead with this? Because I'm not going to be as forward thinking. Or it just may be that I'm working with a technology team or developer team that I'm going to. Ha it's going to take a lot of my time uh, for me to research, develop, train them, get them up to speed. Uh, a lot of them just don't have the resources to to handle with that. So I think it's been brought up a couple of times around the, the lack of resources, the lack of you know will, and and I see uh, OpenShift as a being, you know those two being as a cool technology as something that helps you know why you know help people want to actually work for a government department. So in in that in that way, is do you, do you feel there's any any value in you know, trying to attract talent based on a, a technology? Let's give that to James because he hasn't spoken for a while. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so government has a different ways of doing things and they throw a lot of people at things so you may find out that you could go to one department and there'll be 20 web ops engineers where if you go to another one there might only be five or six and i think being able to adopt something like openshift could actually help change that culture so you could really find something where um, you have maybe a smaller web ops team but you can really specialize in something and be able to provide the opportunities for them to learn more about openshift and also look at saving the department money. At the end of the day, it's all taxpayers' money, so we should look at the most efficient way to do that. Is the most efficient way to look at something that's automatic. You might have to pay licensing for it, but you can do some more automated work with it. Or do you then decide to pay all of the web ops engineers that you might need to maintain a, a fully open source product that you don't need to buy licensing for? I think that's a question that government really needs to tackle. Uh, yeah, I mean, from my perspective, if we're talking about magic here, there are a few magicians out there, of Justin's one of them, um, and, and doing great magic, but magic is that much easier to do in the right environment, and the green, greenfield environments are that much easier. Uh, most of the different departments are still spending most of their time struggling with the legacy equipment and the, the cultural barriers. Um, uh, in, in reality, if you've got an environment, we were talking uh, earlier about the, the, the skills and the, and the uh, uh, 
recruitment and, and retention of staff. If you've got an environment where uh, most of the, the type of C-level uh, executives are uh, career civil servants, but the CIO is typically on a two-year uh, rolling contract. Um, there is no great longevity there, um, and the, the government has had real difficulty um, not only retaining those skills and providing the, the long-term roadmap and the uh, uh, longevity and con continuity in those environments, but also having skills further into the departments because it's been overly reliant on a few of the major, um, uh, what people sometimes refer to as the oligopoly of large companies that always said, look, we'll just do it for you, don't worry about the technology. Um, thankfully, this is starting to change. There are te teams in DevOps within some of the departments that are actually making real progress here, and we as a, a, a one of the disruptive uh, companies in this particular market are, are helping change things, uh, but it has a long way to go. Um, and, I, and I think uh, many of the challenges that um, uh, some of these guys uh, have faced have been faced in very similar circumstances before. We're, we're constantly seeking to reinvent the wheel, but constantly facing the same challenges because of the turnover and because of the, some, in some cases, the rep repetition of the same mistakes. Okay, so I think actually you know, we, we've covered a little bit of this anyway. So we, we talked around then, or we just touched on the cultural adoption. Do we think that is the largest barrier to entry for this? Is the cultural adoption and the different ways of working, taking on containers and tools like OpenShift, is that, is that the key piece, or do you think these organizations are able to overcome it, or is there other, other factors? So I think government's always afraid of lock-in, so there's yep. fairly or unfairly there's a reputation of being locked into certain suppliers for quite a long time. <laughs> um, I think they're afraid of getting locked into other services. Um, OpenShift provides that flexibility, so you can deploy it onto many hosting providers, maybe. We look to AWS, Azure, UK Cloud, um, so there's many options there. Um, I guess it's what the next barrier is. Do they then see OpenShift being locked into as well? So you can only use that type of platform and actually trying to degrade it down is a lot difficult and would cost you a lot of time to be able to make that into a more of an open source product. Um, overall, it's probably more of a cultural um, adoption that you need to look for. Um, as I mentioned previously, there is a lot of we'll recruit a load of people and we'll try and do it as open as we can, but is that the most cost-effective way of doing it? There could be other ways. And that's obviously where we start talking about OpenShift. And, and I think lock-in comes in, in many different forms um, with the, the large suppliers that have uh, dominated this particular market for a long time. Lock-in has come in the form not only of technological lock-in to particular platforms, but in contractual lock-in with monolithic um, contracts that went on for a number of different years. Uh, I think uh, a Brexit is, is actually having a, a dual effect here. In some ways, uh, a lot of uh, organizations are actually putting off um, proper uh, consideration of sort of uh, opening up these contracts because they're so obsessed with w needing to, to deal with Brexit that they're just going to continue rolling over some of their existing contracts rather than se seeking to break out. But in other ways, uh, uh, Brexit is also acting as a disruptor here because they have to do something different. Mm -hmm. um, so it, 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 it varies from department to department depending on, on what, you're, what, what they're doing. Um, but eventually we need to, to reach a point where they are avoiding the lock-in and I think if we were looking for a buzzword in the last debate about what the future is, we would see in, in the government sector the buzzword being around multi-cloud, where uh, uh, so many of the government departments are having to deal with legacy workloads. They've got large uh, Microsoft estates, they've got large Oracle estates, they want to do some stuff that's cloud native, they want to be uh, doing some greenfield stuff in containers, you need that. Uh, multi-cloud uh, 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 opportunity and variety in order to do that and you need to do that without sort of uh, bumbling into a, a, another lock-in uh, uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, Justin? <coughs> I don't really have anything to add. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Sorry. Um, I, you can't stop me from talking. The, um, <laughs> the um, like each, each as, as we pointed out, each department is, is very different from each other department. They, they, you know, have over time have emerged their own uh, unique culture. When I went to an HMRC, people described it as Game of Thrones because everybody was looking to build their own sort of little empire and then fight someone else. And that was kind of how you made your name um, as a sort of certain in that particular department. Um, there, you know, everyone has their own ways of, of doing things. But interestingly, technology um, is often driven by like what the overall purpose of that department is for the time. Um, and in HMRC, 
Um, lots of, the, if you've ever interacted with the tax system, you'll know there's lots of forms. So lots of things were about sort of repeating, repeatable small services um, that, you know, had to just, you know, we had thousands of them. So you just had to build a kind of a factory for building those kinds of repeatable small services. And people, as soon as you offered something that was going to solve that sort of problem, people jumped on it very, very quickly. And it sounded very much like the previous panel, you know, the problems and the, and the issues and the kinds of things we built sounded very similar to, to those things. Uh, where I've worked in other um, in other departments, they have a much more heterogeneous set of things that they do and offer uh, to a different, you know, he more heterogeneous set of people. Um, and so there, it's, it's kind of very difficult just so, sort of from a technology perspective to um, sort of bring along a, a single kind of approach to those things. And people are sort of looking t for something to attack those, you know, number of different problems. But actually the character of those problems is, is pretty different, right? So in Department for Education, you have some things where People are trying to roll out, you know, things that will affect every every school child, and also that will affect every school, and also that will affect people who are applying to become teachers and things like that. And each one of those sort of constituencies, each one of those user groups, is quite different, um, has different kind of needs, and often the technology that has gone in the past to support those different users is quite different. Um, and so the the story is more the question. In in some ways, the barrier is often like, how do we get from where we are today to where we want to be? Yeah, and, and actually, um, when you start off with a bunch of different things that all have very different, you know, maybe different suppliers, maybe different contracts, maybe different technology stacks, um, those things have, have become, even inside a, a single department, have become their own silos. And it's very hard to even parse the question of how do I go from all of this different stuff to one thing, um, especially in, in places where that, as we were sort of saying before, that kind of level of technology sort of literacy and, and longevity of thinking um, is not always there. Um, so those, those sorts of things, they are cultural barriers, but they're kind of, you know, it doesn't mean that there aren't like people who are, who are kind of committed and invested trying to solve these things, it's just actually some of these are quite, quite challenging problems that have been built up over a long period of time. Okay, thank you. Diane, I think we're about on time, are we? Okay. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I think FY18 then, year of the container? Well, 2018. So, so I, I've got a, a take on and a, and a challenge against Chris's, the, the financial services, uh, it'll be 2019 before them, so I've got a challenge to a couple of my customers who are, are in the audience that I think that we can start playing with this service mesh this year and get, get our heads, get ahead of the uh, financial services and I'm willing to probably put a bet on with Chris at some point as to who gets that into production first, so have a chat about that over beer later, but I'd like to thank everybody in the panel yep. for taking part and hopefully being interesting for everybody here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. So before Justin steps down, I just really want to thank Justin Cook. Um, I don't know how many of you um, interacted with him um, over the past month that we organized this event, but Justin was pretty key to getting this space and helping us get this off the ground. So thank you very much, Justin, for all this. Thank you.